uh, the concrete and therefore later on when it cools it contracts and creates cracks so they cool the water when the concrete is mixed up in the batch plant right next to the batch plant there was a refrigeration plant so they're actually using cold water to make the concrete and of course on a hot summer day in page uh, that was extra important and then they also have uh, tubes that run through the dam uh, at the bottom of every one of these 700, uh, seven and a half foot lifts, there are one inch uh, aluminum pipes that carry 40 degree water through it to carry away the heat. And it was something like uh, 840 miles of these cooling pipes. These were later filled full of grout, so they're not open today. This is the downstream side of the power plant and where the water will eventually exit the power plant down at the bottom. For every load that uh, was dropped, um, these were 12 cubic yards for every one of these buckets. Uh, immediately, a team of uh, three guys with these giant vibrators would start vibrating the concrete trying to get out all the air bubbles and fill in all the pocket pockets next to the forms. And this was considered to be the most brutal job uh, on the whole project, uh, working with these vibrators. So there were actually two teams. If things were really working well, uh, there would be a new 12 yards drop every two or three minutes. And so these two teams would take turns working back and forth, and they would put in about 20 inches of concrete. The uh, bucket would spread out to about 20 inches thick, and they were interlaced. And it would take uh, up to a day to go up one lift in one of the bigger blocks. This is how the concrete was moved to different sections of the dam during the dam construction. There were these towers that could roll back and forth, could uh, allow uh, controller to pick up a bucket of concrete uh, from the trestle and move it to any part of the dam or the power plant. There are the vibrators that work again. So the face of the dam had to be cleaned up a little bit after the uh, initial pour and that's what these ladders do. They allow access to all points and they uh, in some cases, you could get to some of the grouting pipes or the uh, cooling pipes. You can see that there's kind of a pattern here. It's a tall block followed by a short block, tall block, short block, so that uh, the tall ones stayed tall all during the entire project. And that meant that they didn't have so much uh, time spent on making forms for all of the blocks. The uh, tall blocks became the side forms for the short blocks. And also, the second set of blocks farther upstream was always behind the, the front blocks. When you look down at the dam today, you see that big grassy field at the base of the dam. Uh, there's 100 feet of fill, a little bit more than 100 feet of fill and that was just uh, dirt that was taken from the downstream copper dam and moved back upstream in between the power plant and the dam. These are the towers that are going to carry the water between the dam and the power plant, but everything else that you see when you look down on that grassy field is just 100 feet of dirt and sand. Cooling lines again. Well, the day came when they actually throttled down on the diversion tunnels and Lake Powell began to rise. Uh, they closed the right one first and then two months later, 1963, they closed the left diversion tunnel. Lake Powell began to rise very fast and by April of 1963, it overtopped the uh, upstream coffer dam. So here's the beginning of Lake Powell and the end of the upstream coffer dam. These are the four river outlets that I mentioned that were on the left side of the dam. These are the ones that are used for the special high flows today to help uh, beaches in Grand Canyon. And under emergency conditions, these were also used, uh, such as 1983.
when you come down through the access tunnel to go along the Colorado River Discovery Trips from the base of the dam down to Lee's Ferry, you park uh, your bus on a big concrete slab uh, kind of next to one of the shops at the base of the dam. This, this is what is underneath that big concrete slab that your bus is parked on. Get up a little higher, then you can start to see where the pinstocks are going to come down from the face of the dam, and then there's an elbow, and they straighten out, and they're headed for these towers uh, that carry the water uh, downstream to the uh, power plant. Each one of these is 15 feet in diameter. There are eight of them going to eight turbines. There was an awful lot of work that went in to just getting up to the level that we see today as the base of the dam. Uh, there's like 130 feet of dam that's below what you can see, and of course that's the biggest, thickest part of the dam down there. So now we're just getting up a little bit above what you see today as the base of the dam. These sloping uh, water-carrying tubes are going up uh, to the upstream face of the dam. They're going to end up intercepting the upstream face of the dam over 200 feet below the normal high level of Lake Powell. There had to be a compromise made here. You want those intakes for the turbines to be up high enough so that the silt level, which is gradually going to build up, won't get to those intakes for a long time, but you don't want them so high that fluctuations in lake level are going to come down below the level of those intakes. Uh, back uh, in 2005, we became concerned that the lake was going to go down uh, to the level of the intakes. And nothing was done at Glen Canyon Dam uh, to try to get around that problem, but the Navajo Generating Station, also outside of Page, the coal fire plant, they actually drilled some new tubes that go down um, to the uh, Colorado Gorge. Uh, slam drilled these tubes and went down an extra 70 feet or so, just in case Lake Powell went down below their intakes, their original intakes, which are at the same level as the intakes as the original intakes on the dam. There are the penstock tubes. This is uh, just below the grassy field that we see today. I'm seeing blue flashes occasionally. I don't know where those are coming from. <laughs> so here are the intakes uh, for the uh, pin stocks that go down to the turbines. So we're still about 230 feet above the, or below the crest of the dam. Uh, this is what it looked like after the dam had built, been built up higher, and those intake, intakes also have to have trash racks on them to protect the turbines down below. And the back of the dam, and uh, maybe most notable here, is all of the debris that's floating at the back of the dam, and that's because as the lake is rising, it's going into all these side canyons and picking up all of the driftwood, all of the dead cottonwoods in every side canyon, and all that stuff, uh, or a lot of it, ends up floating down the canyon, uh, down to the base of the dam. Also, you can see here the eight intakes for the turbines, and then kind of back in here around the corner are the intakes uh, for the river outlets. Well, the dam ended up at uh, 710 feet uh, tall, uh, but relatively thin at the top, and so in order to make the roadway wide enough, there's actually a cantilever section that sticks out of there. I think it's 10 feet. Also, you can see one of the galleries that allows you to walk from one end of the dam to the other. There are four different levels. This is the utility gallery, which is just below the crest of the dam, but all the way down to almost the base, you can walk from one end of the dam to the other. And then there are tunnels that connect those vertically. And so there are about two miles of inspection tunnels inside the dam. Lem Wiley threw his hat into the last bucket of concrete, 1963. Uh, so Lem Wiley's hat, his fedora that he used on the entire project, is still embedded in Block 25. <laughs>
Well, the dam worked pretty well. It took uh, 17 years to fill Lake Powell, which was uh, over twice as long as the amount of time it took to fill Lake Mead, even though Lake Mead's volume was a little bit larger than Lake Powell. But by 1963, we were using a lot more water upstream than we were um, uh, back in the 1930s. So uh, 17 years to fill Lake Powell. And it's gone up and down ever since. Uh, this is the way it should look when the lake is at its fullest and water is going around the uh, dam by way of the spillway tunnels. And in 1983, because of uh, problems in the uh, way the amount of snowpack was estimated and because there were some really late snows and because there was really no spring in 1983. It went from the middle of winter to the middle of summer very suddenly. Uh, all of the rivers of the uh, river basin were flooding. So all of a sudden we found, or the Bureau of Reclamation found, that the reservoirs were pretty close to full and yet there was a huge amount of water coming downstream. So they started using the uh, tunnels in 83, but they knew that there was a problem. And this had been spotted when the lake uh, had first filled in 1980 and there was a cavitation problem where the concrete is eaten away by the fast moving water and the vacuums that form downstream or downflow from little imperfections in the concrete. So they hated to see all this water going through these diversion tunnels or spillway tunnels uh, because they knew that there was going to be a problem and here was the problem. Uh, after the flood, this is in late July or maybe August 1983, this is what the tunnel looked like on the floor. The three feet of concrete that protected the sandstone walls from these high flows was totally destroyed just downstream from the elbow. And you can see all of the rubble, both concrete and sandstone, lying in the bottom of the spillway tunnel about a thousand feet upstream from this point there was a lake that uh, wasn't supposed to be there and we're looking upstream up that slanting portion of the tunnel up towards the top of the lake and all these cavitation holes it turned out that this lake uh, that this little boat is floating on here uh, was about 2500 cubic yards of debris that had been removed. That's how much concrete it took to fill it. And it was uh, 45 feet wide, 50 feet deep, and 150 feet long. So once they drained the lake where this hole was, it looked like this. So we're looking up that tunnel. So this is looking up at about a 45 degree angle up in here. And here are the edges of that three feet of concrete. And then this huge hole that was eroded out by cavitation and erosion. Well, there was a good prospect that the following year we'll also have a big snowpack in the Colorado Rockies. So uh, we needed to get this fixed really fast. So man work began quickly. They used the access tunnel that came down to the base of the dam and drilled new tunnels that intercepted the uh, spillway tunnels so that they could drive uh, trucks and equipment into the tunnels. So here's the concern. I've gone back to one of the Bureau of Reclamation historic photographs. Here's where the dam's going to go. This is the left spillway tunnel. And as you can see, this tunnel that goes down at about a 45 degree angle goes right by the future seat of the dam. And they were afraid that if these holes kept enlarging, it would jeopardize the dam, actually. So that was the major fear. They didn't really fear water going over the top of the dam. They said that that was OK. It wouldn't be good for the power plant down <laughs> below, but, but the dam itself could stay on that kind of a problem. But these holes that were enlarging in the spillways uh, were a big concern. The uh, right diversion tunnel, or the right spillway tunnel, was not used as much during the flood, and so the damage there was still considerable, but not as bad as the left one. 
So in 1883, we had a whole different system of carving out tunnels from the sandstone. We were no longer drilling 150 holes back into the rock and blasting it out with explosives. They had these molds, and you just moved this machine up to the face of the rock and just ate away at it. 